In order to sail to the Channel Islands off Southern California's coast, we had better learn more about the San Pedro Channel we will be sailing across. The San Pedro Channel is on average 1,500 feet deep between the mainland and the islands. On the backside of the islands, the depth quickly increases to one mile and continues deeper the further from the islands. Hi friends, it's Daniel from the Los Angeles Maritime Institute. A couple weeks ago, we learned about water, specifically the water cycle and watershed. Last week, we talked about how animals adapt to survive and thrive in their environments. This week, we're going to focus on the ocean, its zones, and the animals who make it their home. The ocean is huge and deep. The average depth of the ocean is about 12,100 feet. There are all sorts of creatures that live in the ocean, from the surface all the way down to the deepest depths. The deepest part of the ocean is called the Challenger Deep and is in the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. When you go to the beach, you see water, right? Duh. You may see dolphins or sea stars, maybe a sea urchin. Do you think that those animals also live in the Mariana Trench? The deepest part of the ocean? If you answered no, then you're correct. Sea urchins and dolphins can't survive 12,000 feet underwater because the water conditions are not perfect for them. There would not be enough sunlight or nutrients down there for them to survive. Because the ocean is so big, with different animals and organisms living at different depths, scientists have broken the ocean into layers, or zones. These zones extend from the surface to the most extreme depths where light can no longer penetrate. These deep zones are where some of the most bizarre and fascinating creatures in the sea can be found. Today, Jonah is going to take us on an adventure through the ocean zones. Humans can't swim through all these zones, though. So Jonah, in this adventure, will be a sperm whale. Sperm whales are mammals, just like you and me. Which means, despite living in the ocean... Jonah is still going to have to come up to the surface to breathe. Most sperm whales can hold their breath for up to 90 minutes, or an hour and a half. Wow! Jonah just took a big gulp of air and said hello to the sunshine and is ready for adventure. When he's at the surface getting air, he is in the epipelagic zone, also called the sunlight zone, because the sun shines through into the water. The first zone is the epipelagic zone. Let's break that word down. Epi is a prefix meaning upon, similar to how your epidermis is the layer of skin that sits on top. The epipelagic zone is the layer at the top of the ocean. It's measured from the surface down to 650 feet and is where about 90% of all marine life exists because of the abundance of sunlight. Plankton can photosynthesize, meaning use the sunlight to make food, in the sunlight zone. Small fish will eat the plankton, and big fish will eat those small fish. Here we will find dolphins, kelp, sperm whales, phytoplankton, sharks, humans, and plenty of fish. Down we go! The second layer is the mesopelagic or twilight zone. Meso means middle, as this zone is near the middle of the ocean. It extends from 650 feet down to 3,300 feet. Only 1% of sunlight reaches the twilight zone. So, animals here have adapted by having large eyes that are focused upward to see as much light as possible. They also tend to be camouflaged to have lighter bellies and darker tops. This way, a predator looking up from below might not see them as they blend in with the sun shining in the lighter waters above, and predators looking down might not see them against the shadowy depths below. This is called countershading and is done anywhere in the ocean that sunlight reaches. In addition to the countershading, some fish here have lanterns on their heads that help them see and hunt other fish. Here are some of Jonah's friends in the twilight zone. We've got crabs and cuttlefish, eels, octopus, pufferfish, shrimp, and giant squid. 
Humans can even visit the Twilight Zone, but only by diving. Most creatures here make daily vertical migrations, rising up to the sunlight zone to feed at night when they won't be seen by other predators, and back down to the twilight zone during the day. Jonah's destination is even deeper though, so once Jonah dives through the twilight zone and reaches 3,300 feet, he makes it to the bathypelagic zone, also called the Midnight Zone. Bathy means deep, though there are still much deeper parts of the ocean. The Midnight Zone extends from 3,300 feet all the way down to 13,000 feet. Wow! Did you know that's as tall as 10 Empire State Buildings? Like the name suggests, the midnight zone is dark as night, with no sunlight reaching this deep down in the ocean. Despite the absence of light, Jonah can still find some friends down here. Jonah might run into some anglerfish, squid, or jellyfish. He could even see some human friends, but they would have to be in a submarine. He might mistake his human friends in a submarine for another whale. Jonah is down in the midnight zone looking for food, and so are a lot of other bigger fish. For Jonah, those bigger fish, squids, and sharks are food. Nom, nom, nom. There are some zones in the ocean that are even deeper than the bathypelagic zone that Jonah can't dive down to. The fourth zone, for example, is called the abyssopelagic zone, or the abyssal zone. Abyss comes from a Greek word that means bottomless. This layer goes from 13,000 feet down to 20,000 feet. There are only a few organisms adapted to survive in the abyssopelagic zone because of the freezing temperatures and incredible pressures. Animals capable of living at these depths include some species of squid, octopus, and deep-sea fish, like the blobfish. Some deep-sea creatures, like the deep-sea squid, have adapted to be bioluminescent, meaning their bodies give off light. This can be used to see, to communicate, or distract predators or prey. Other crustaceans living at these depths have adapted by becoming transparent and have evolved without eyes because they serve no purpose at these depths. Jonah wouldn't be able to visit friends down here at this depth, but he could send a postcard. The fifth and final layer is the Hadopelagic, or Hadal Zone. This zone was named after Hades, ruler of the underworld in Greek mythology. It goes from 20,000 feet all the way to the bottom, the deepest point being around 36,000 feet in the Mariana Trench near Japan. Around 400 known species live in this zone, including a rat tail fish and decapods. A lot of the Hadal Zone is still unexplored. There's so much we still don't know. Now that we've made it to the bottom of the ocean, Jonah needs to go back up to the surface to get air. Here is something to think about. Would you want to live in the sunlight zone, near the surface, or in the hadopelagic zone where no one would bother you? Thanks for coming and learning about ocean zones with me and Jonah. Now you can complete the online worksheets and activities that go along with this video. Excuse me. Where's this boat from? What's its name?
they scoon a trawler on the St. George run. Swept for mine in the war, then back to Haddon Pod. An added third mast made her the Natalie Todd. With her strong steel masts and new harrows and sheets, she proceeded to join the main with Jen Fleet. Ten years later, she sailed right through Panama. Over 7,000 miles here to California. boat. Hello everyone. Today we are sailing the American Pride tall ship to the Channel Islands off the Southern California coast. There is a whole chain of islands, but what do we know about them? Zoe Allen, a marine science educator at the Roundhouse Aquarium Teaching Center in Manhattan Beach and at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in San Pedro is here today to tell us all about these islands. Welcome to Coasting with Maddie, Zoe. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, so where are the Channel Islands located and how many are there? So the Channel Islands are located along the coast of Southern California. And they're broken up into two categories. You have your Northern Channel Islands and your Southern Channel Islands. So there are four of the Northern Channel Islands, which are San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anna Kappa. The furthest of those is San Miguel, which is about 26 miles off the coast of Ventura. And then the closest, which is also the smallest of the islands, is Anna Kappa. And that one is only about nine miles off uh, the mainland. The Northern Channel Islands are actually all connected and they form one giant island called Santa Rosa. And you just can't see it because the connection of all of those is underwater. And then there are four Southern Channel Islands, 
which are San Clemente, Santa Catalina, San Nicolas, and Santa Barbara. Now, San Clemente is the southernmost of those islands, and it's about 40 miles off the coast. And then Catalina, which is probably one of the most well-known of the islands, is about 22 miles right off the coast here in Los Angeles. Great. So how can we visit these islands? Yeah, so it's actually um, pretty easy to visit at least some of them. The best way to do that is by boat. That's pretty much the only way you can actually get there. And it's possible to visit almost all of them. Not all of them, but almost all of them. And so the one that's easiest to travel to, and like I said, the most popular is Catalina. Um, like you said, you probably saw it in some of the previous episodes. You go to the Catalina Express, which um, come out of San Pedro, Long Beach, as well as Dana Point. And Catalina is uh, really accessible to visitors and tourists. There's all sorts of like hotels and restaurants and shopping that you can do in the main town of Avalon. Um, but then you can also visit any of the Northern Channel Islands as, um, as well as Santa Barbara Island. And there are boats that go out of Ventura and Oxnard that, that can take you out there. Now, uh, these islands are a bit more rugged than Catalina. They're owned by the National Park Service. So it's just like if you were to go to a national park on the mainland. And so these islands, uh, like I said, are more rugged and they're really great for hiking, camping, even kayaking, scuba diving, and fishing. Um, and then these ones, they don't have restaurants or hotels or even drinking water. So that means if you go there, then you have to be prepared to bring your own food and your own water. Um, now, unfortunately, you can't visit San Clemente or San Nicolas Island uh, because they're owned by the U.S. Navy and they're used for um, like as a training base as well as weapons testing. Um, however, if you do own your own boat, then you can go near the islands. You just can't step foot on those islands. Very interesting. It's it's super cool how they're all con connected, like you said earlier, underwater, but still at the surface level, it's like a bunch of like little different, different little, well, yeah, islands. Um, yeah. Well, when were the islands formed? So these islands were formed around 15 million years ago, and it was a result of tectonic plate movement as well as volcanoes uh, that were erupting from underneath the earth, from underneath the uh, surface of the ocean. And this is a process, process that took millions and millions of years. And what's really great is that evidence of this can be seen on islands such as Santa Cruz Island, which has these huge, amazing rock formations that are made out of volcanic igneous rock. And this igneous rock has formed this beautiful, rugged um, cliffside and gigantic sea caves. In fact, one of the largest sea caves in the entire world is the painted caves of Santa Cruz Island. They are massive and they're painted because they have rocks of all different colors. It's really beautiful inside. And then uh, some of these islands also have sedimentary rock. And the sedimentary rock forms layers of sediment that have settled down on top of each other over millions of years and have compressed. And you can actually see the lines and the layers that are along some of the cliff sides of the islands. And then that's also where a lot of scientists have also found um, different fossils, such as fish fossils, marine invertebrates, and even whales. So that is evidence that these islands were once underwater many, many years ago. Now, since these islands have been around for a super long time, have there ever been people that have lived on the islands or are there any people that are living there now? It's a great question. So currently the only island where there are people that permanently live there is Catalina. You know, people have their homes out there, they work there, and there is even a school there for kids that grow up on the island. Uh, as for the other ones, no one currently um, lives on them permanently except for some of the ones that have to have park rangers that stay out there, um, but they don't permanently live out there. Um, however, there were people that once lived on these islands, such as uh, Native American tribes, such as the Chumash and the Tongva Native Americans, lived on these islands thousands of years ago and they utilized the land out there. 
Um, then around the early 1600s came the Spanish explorers and they settled on those islands, uh, displacing many of the Native Americans, but also that's where those islands got their name. The Spanish explorers are the ones who named those islands and then later went on to build the missions all across the California coast. Uh, and then up until the 1980s, there were actually families who, um, who bought those islands and they used it for ranching purposes. So they would bring over cattle, sheep, pigs, and they would grow all sorts of different crops. Now, unfortunately, due to all this ranching, they actually ended up changing a lot of the natural environment that was out there by introducing all sorts of non-native species to the island. And it wasn't until uh, the 1980s that the National Park Service bought the land from these families and they were able to start to restore the habitat to, once it, to what it once was. And they're still currently working on that now. I remember visiting Catalina and being so shocked at how many buffalo I saw. What other kinds of plants and animals can you expect to find on these islands? Yeah, so the buffalo is a really good example of an animal that was introduced to those Channel Islands. Uh, they were brought out there actually for a movie, for a movie set, and they just kind of uh, multiplied and stayed out there. Now, the Channel Islands, um, they're home to many different species of plants and animals, many of which are what we call endemic, or they can only be found on those islands. So that means a lot of them are very rare, um, they could even be threatened or endangered. And many of these species have a mainland ancestor from which they evolved from. And because the islands are so isolated from the mainland, they evolved into completely different species that makes them very unique. Uh, for example, the Channel Island Fox, which is found on six of the eight islands, evolved from the mainland gray fox. And over time, the Channel Island fox has evolved to become much smaller uh, than its mainland relative due to the lack of resources and predators that are found on the islands. And this is a process that scientists call island dwarfism. And island dwarfism can be found in many of the mammals that are on those islands, including the island spotted skunk and the island deer mouse. Um, a great example of a plant that's on the island that evolved from a mainland ancestor is the island tory pine, which is actually the plant that is behind me. That is an island tory pine on Santa Rosa Island. Now, um, the island, there's only two places in the entire world that you can find tory pines here on Santa Rosa Island and then in Tory Pines State Park in San Diego. Um, and so due to the geographic isolation of the island, uh, the island tory pine evolved into its own species. Uh, now what's really cool is that there are also animals that used to live on the island, but have since gone extinct. Uh, a great example of that is the pygmy mammoth. And the pygmy mammoths grew to be about six and a half feet tall, uh, which is another example of that island dwarfism because the uh, mainland ancestor of the pygmy mammoths grew to be about 14 feet tall. So these island pygmy mammoths were very small, about the size of maybe a really tall human. And unfortunately, they went extinct about 10,000 years ago, but their fossils can still be found on the island to this day. When, when you talk about fossils, um, how often are there people out there researching the islands and looking for different types of fossils and different types of plant species and things like that? That's a good question. I'm not sure, but I'm sure that there are lots of uh, different organizations such as the Nature Conservancy goes out there a lot to do research and the National Park Service. And there are probably lots of universities um, and other researchers that go out there as well. Um, but as for the frequency of that, I'm not sure. But um, it's probably quite often because it's, um, there's a lot of those fossils out there. So how did they arrive onto the islands? Sure, yeah. So um, when you think about all these uh, animals and plants on this island, you kind of might have a question of how did these 
uh, how did these creatures get to this island? Because they are completely surrounded by a really vast stretch of ocean. Seems like it'd be really hard for animals to get there. They don't just magically appear. They have to come from somewhere. And so there's actually a few theories as to where they all came from. And uh, one of those, actually, if you go back a few like thousands of years, uh, the sea level right around the Ice Age was a lot lower than it is right now. So that means that the distance between the islands and the mainland was a lot shorter. So animals such as mammoths that can actually swim, uh, they didn't have to travel that far. So it was really easy for them to travel to these islands. And then for other animals that weren't able to swim, it's possible that they might have drifted or floated on perhaps trees or pieces of wood or anything that could float across a stretch of ocean. So that's how they think that the, um, the gray fox was able to make it to those islands. And the same can be said for plants. They could have traveled that way as well. They could have even traveled across with birds carrying them or the wind. And it's even possible that the Native Americans brought over lots of different animals, different plants and things like that. Um, but really, no matter how these species arrived on the island, once they did, they evolved and became something completely different and unique, uh, which really makes the Channel Islands a place like nowhere else in California. It's a really amazing place. <laughs> 